Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're gonna be going over a very common interview question and also case study and modeling task here, which is how to go from EBITDA to free cash flow. So let's just start with the very short, simple answer here and say that free cash flow equals EBITDA minus the net interest expense on the income statement minus taxes, plus or minus other non-cash adjustments, plus or minus the change in working capital minus CapEx. And the idea is that free cash flow is normally defined as cash flow from operations on the cash flow statement minus CapEx, and it represents a company's ability to repay debt or to spend something on acquisitions, on dividends, stock or purchases, and other things like that. In interviews, it is very common to get questions about different ways to calculate free cash flow, especially starting from different numbers, such as net income versus EBITDA versus cash flow from operations. And in case studies, you need to be prepared for this because they will give you different types of models that start with different metrics or ask you to move between different metrics. So let's go into Excel and look at our example here, and I'll show you how to do this. I have up here a financial model for BMC Stock Holdings, which is one of the companies that's featured in our M&A case studies on the Breaking Into Wall Street site. And if you go all the way down to the bottom here, we have alternate free cash flow calculations. And I've already calculated an operating income or EBIT and EBITDA. So EBITDA is just operating income plus depreciation and amortization. Now to go from EBITDA to free cash flow, we start by finding the net interest expense and other income and expenses on the income statement. So I will go up here and I will sum up the interest expense, interest income, and other income. I'm not going to include the goodwill impairment because this is more of a non-recurring charge. So we're going to leave out that part of it. We'll include all these. Then we will take the taxes, which should be shown on the income statement. So I'll go up to the income tax line and take this. These are both deductions so far. And then we have this one for other non-cash adjustments. This obviously allows for a lot of wiggle room, but if you go up to the company's cash flow statement and you look at what they have, we would say that the amortization of debt discounts and issuance fees should be included here because this is effectively non-cash interest. We're not going to add back the goodwill impairment because we didn't include this at all in the net interest expense and other income, but I will include deferred income taxes, which reduces our cash taxes paid a little bit, and then other items down here as well. Then we do want to include the change of working capital. So I'll go up and link to it. Now, some people say that you should subtract the change in working capital. That's not quite correct. You should subtract the increase in working capital. And so we list this as plus or minus the change in working capital, because if it decreases, it's an addition. If it increases, it's a subtraction. So the sign here could be either positive or negative, depending on what's happening. And then we also want to subtract capital expenditures. So let's go up to the cash flow from investing section and take it from right here. And then we can sum these up to get to the free cash flow. And I will copy this across. And now we have our free cash flow figure. And so you can see how EBITDA is a much, much higher number than free cash flow here because EBITDA is before taxes, net interest, the change in working capital, and capital expenditures. So that is the short version of how to do this. Now for the written version of this tutorial and the Excel file demonstration for what I'm using here, you'll want to go to this URL, breakingintowallstreet.com slash KB slash financial statement analysis slash EBITDA to FCF. I'll link to this video and pin it as the first comment below the video. So you can just click on it there as well. If you want some more detail on this topic beyond the short, simple answer, I will go through the following points in this tutorial. First, we'll talk about different ways to calculate free cash flow in general. Then we'll talk about how to go from EBITDA to free cash flow to equity and free cash flow to firm, otherwise known as levered free cash flow and unlevered free cash flow. We'll talk about some subtleties in the calculation and some additional points that a lot of other tutorials gloss over. And then we'll talk about lease accounting, which I know is everyone's favorite topic and the least confusing topic ever. I'm being sarcastic, by the way. But we will talk about this a little bit and explain how it differs under US GAAP and IFRS and what to take into account when dealing with leases. So let's start with some alternate ways to calculate free cash flow. And I'm going to show you how all these are equivalent in Excel. The most basic method is to take a company's cash flow from operations and subtract CapEx. Another way is to start with net income or net income to common if there's preferred stock, add back DNA, adjust for other non-cash adjustments, factor in the change in working capital and subtract CapEx. And the reason this works is because essentially cash flow from operations, if you think about it, starts with net income, adds back DNA, adjusts for these non-cash adjustments and has the change in working capital. So effectively these parts are the same thing. These terms here 
are the same as cash flow from operations. Or you could start with EBITDA as we just did, in which case it's EBITDA minus the net interest expense minus taxes, plus or minus other non-cash adjustments, plus or minus the change in working capital minus CapEx. The most important principle here is that free cash flow should always deduct the company's financing costs or their net financing costs, the taxes, and reinvestment into the business in the form of the change in working capital and CapEx. EBITDA does not deduct any of those. So if you understand this basic principle for how free cash flow and EBITDA are different, you should always be able to calculate this number based on EBITDA or any other metric. One thing you have to be careful about is with the tax numbers here, you do want to count both DNA and net interest as deductions in this number. Be careful because sometimes you calculate taxes slightly differently as you'll see in the second part here. So let's go up and I'll show you how to do this in Excel and how all these are actually equivalent. So the most traditional calculation is cash flow from operations minus CapEx. So I'm going to calculate it like this initially. Sum this up and copy this across. And you can see how looking at it right here, free cash flow under this method is exactly the same as when we calculate free cash flow starting with EBITDA. Now you could also start with net income. So if we go up and go to our net income at the bottom of the income statement, let's take it from right there. Then we'll want to take our depreciation and amortization from the cash flow statement. So we'll take these two numbers. Then we have other non-cash adjustments. Now here, you have to be careful because yes, we want to add back the non-cash interest and the deferred income taxes and the other items. But I would also say that we should add back the goodwill impairment here because on the income statement, the goodwill impairment actually does affect pre-tax income and net income when we start with net income for this calculation. So it's a very minor point, but I would say that it's a little bit more prudent to include that here. And then finally, the change of working capital and CapEx. So let's go up and get the change of working capital. And then let's get capital expenditures right here. And then we can add these all up and see that we get to the same number. So no matter how we calculate free cash flow, it comes out to the same number right here. Let's take this and copy this across. And so we have that, and it's the same going all the way across. So those are a couple of different methods of calculating free cash flow based on a real company's financial statements. Now, for part two, I want to talk about some variants of free cash flow, namely free cash flow to equity and free cash flow to firm. Now, free cash flow to equity, also known as levered free cash flow, is very similar to the standard free cash flow metric, but it also factors in debt issuances and deducts debt repayments. Some people argue about the specific numbers or the specific types of issuances and repayments should, that should be included here. But we're just going to add these two terms to the end of the EBITDA to free cash flow calculation to do this. So right here, I will go up to the cash flow statement and take the debt issuances and then the debt repayments. I'm using positive signs because they already have a positive or negative sign in front. So I'll take these and then I'll calculate free cash flow to equity like that. And you can see that it is a fair bit lower because this company happens to be repaying debt in each year. Now, free cash flow to firm, otherwise known as unlevered free cash flow, is slightly trickier because it excludes net interest and the changes in debt. And we have to recalculate taxes because taxes here should be excluding the impact of interest because this is a capital structure neutral metric. So to calculate it like this, we start with EBITDA. For taxes, notice how taxes are now excluding the effect of interest. So what that means is that we should actually take EBIT and multiply by the tax rate right here, and we should recalculate taxes. And as a direct result here, the taxes are slightly different than they were in the first version of this, where we factored in those deductions. The tax rate was also slightly different, which messes up things a little bit here. For the other non-cash adjustments, we can actually just take the same exact line from right here. So I'll just copy and paste it down to save a bit of time. And then for the change of working capital, same thing. We can just copy and paste these formulas down because we're doing effectively the same thing right here. And so now we get free cash flow to firm, which as you might expect is significantly higher than free cash flow to equity. It makes perfect sense because this is before the interest expense and before any net debt changes right here. So overall it is significantly higher, at least in these years. So now let's go to part three and talk about some subtleties in this calculation. One issue that comes up a lot is that sometimes a company has other financing costs besides just the net interest expense. So for example, if a company has preferred dividends, you definitely want to subtract those. I'm bringing up an example here for one of our LBO case studies on this company's superior industries. 
they have preferred stock with preferred dividends. And so when we calculate free cash flow here, starting from EBITDA or really any metric, we want to make sure these are deducted as well. And if you look at the free cash flow calculation in this LBO model, we are starting with net income to common, which deducts the preferred dividends and using that to get to free cash flow here at the bottom. Now, some of these preferred dividends are non-cash, which is fine, but we still want to deduct them and then adjust for that in the free cash flow calculation. So you have to be careful of other items that might factor in. With taxes, you should subtract cash taxes in all forms of free cash flow, but companies often have deferred taxes, which can be part of the other non-cash adjustments line, or you could just try to adjust the tax number manually, but you have to be really careful about this as well. The change in working capital could sometimes include some additional items. I'm gonna bring up this model for Netflix right here and point out that yes, of course they have a change in working capital, but they also have some pretty large light items for content assets and content liabilities and content asset amortization. If we were calculating free cash though, starting from net income or EBITDA or really any metric, we want to make sure that these are included because these are clearly a core part of the business and effectively these are like inventory for Netflix. They don't have physical inventory, but they have content inventory. And so we'd wanna make sure that these are also factored into the calculation, even though you won't see this in standard textbook definitions online. With CapEx, you could also deduct items beyond this. For example, many companies have recurring acquisitions or purchases of intangibles, but it really depends on the company and industry. For something like Builders First Source, we could arguably count acquisitions here, but it depends a little bit on the purpose of this metric. If we were trying to calculate the cash flow available to make acquisitions, we would not deduct this. But if we wanted to calculate the remaining cash flow after acquisitions that we could use to repay debt or issue dividends, then we might actually factor this in as a recurring line item right here. So it depends heavily on the company and the industry in the context. For the final topic here, I want to discuss lease accounting briefly. So under US GAAP, this is not really a big deal because the operating lease expense should be deducted in operating income and net income and cash flow from operations. So there's nothing to do. If a company has finance leases, you should try to deduct the whole expense, which means looking up the lease principal repayments for those finance leases and deducting it within free cash flow. So there's a bit of an extra step, but if the finance leases are very small, people often just skip this or ignore it because it doesn't really make a huge difference. Now under IFRS, it gets a lot more complicated because you have the split between lease interest, lease depreciation, and lease principal repayments. And basically in the free cash flow metrics, you wanna make sure that everything is deducted and that all the cash impacts are factored in. So the easiest thing to do is to deduct the lease principal repayments on the cash flow statement and then factor in any net cash effects from things like the lease assets and liabilities changing by different amounts. The most important point here is that the company still pays for all these leases in cash. The accounting looks a little bit different, but ultimately all types of leases involve cash payments. So let's bring up this example here for Watches of Switzerland, which is another one of our LBO case studies. And on the cash flow statement for this company, we calculate free cash flow by taking cash flow from operations and then subtracting CapEx, acquisition related CapEx, and then several line items related to lease assets and liabilities here. And so what's really going on is that we wanna make sure we capture the full lease expense, which is why we deduct the lease principal or payments. There's also a slight cash difference because the asset and liability are going up at different rates. If we calculate free cash flow starting with EBITDA therefore, yes, we still start with EBITDA, we deduct net interest, taxes, other non-cash adjustments, the change in working capital, CapEx, all that's fine. but we also have to include these lease related line items because these are a core part in the company's business. They do cost it something on a recurring basis. And we always want to make sure that these cash outflows associated with leases are deducted in the free cash flow number. So that's about it. Let's do a quick recap and summary. Alternate ways to calculate free cash flow. I'll highlight in three, there are probably more, but you can say that free cash flow equals cash flow from operations minus CapEx. You can start with net income add back DNA, make other non-cash adjustments, factor in the change of working capital and subtract CapEx, or you can start with EBITDA, subtract the net interest expense, taxes, adjust for other non-cash items, factor in the change of working capital and subtract CapEx. Now, if you're going from EBITDA to free cash flow to equity or free cash flow to firm, free cash flow to equity is fairly simple. Just factor in the net change in debt. EBITDA to free cash flow to firm is a little bit more complex. You start with EBITDA, 
subtract basically EBIT times the tax rate, adjust for other non-cash items, the change in working capital, and CapEx. There are some more subtleties around items like preferred dividends and additional things that might qualify for the change in working capital. And for some companies, you might deduct more than just CapEx, for example. And then with lease accounting, under US GAAP, it's fairly simple and shouldn't present too many issues. Under IFRS, you just have to be really careful to capture the full lease expense and also any small cash effects from lease assets and liabilities changing at different rates. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about how to go from EBITDA to free cash flow, both the simple method and the interview answer, and then how it works in real life and some subtleties that a lot of other tutorials don't really mention.